I like to playfully look at it as basically how to how to roll down a hill in in some intelligent way. Um, cool. Uh, and like um, like was just said before, uh, we can we can make this like largely question driven. I don't expect to get through every bit of material I have in the presentation today. Uh, I'd rather like address your questions and then you know I'll provide the slides as references if you want to keep looking through the stuff. Um, Cool. So um, I thought since I came from the particle physics world, I'll give you um, a, a small anecdote from particle physics to begin. Um, so one of my favorite um, people I met in the field was a professor from Harvard called Mel Melissa Franklin, uh, who visited my department at Lund um, University for, for some time. Um, and and she, she often was quoted saying something similar to this, uh, which was basically, um, we were all experimental particle physicists, uh, but she would always advocate to know enough, you know, theory about what we were doing to be able to talk to a theorist. Um, so uh, today I, I, I wish to paraphrase this and say, uh, and hopefully, you know, the aim of this presentation is to show you guys enough AI that you can talk to like an AIS or whatever, you know, like uh, being able to communicate about these, you know, very popular ideas uh, in the field uh, and especially in the context of uh, what you're doing uh, in, in medical science. Um, so what could AI mean? there's a bunch of different things uh a bit of a buzzword you know you'll be you'll be hearing this in the news with chat gpt and stuff like that and i'll come back to that point in a, in a second um but i'll show you three potential candidates uh for things that appear intelligent so um we can think of ai in a sense uh, as anything done by a computer that d just like mm -hmm. gives uh, some oh uh, just uh, can to we justify one request with you just is that um someone needing to be muted or is that a question so i no, just muted you. nathan okay muted thank you someone. uh cool um so yeah uh three three different categories of of, of, of appeared intelligence uh, and the first one is uh simulation uh, and so this is basically like we have this cool um little graph on the right um i think this is actually an implementation of the sir model uh, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, you write down a set of rules um, and you just kind of hit go. Uh, and what happens is, you know, your, your like state of the world um, evolves over time uh, in what appears to be some intelligent way, right? So this is like a kind of artificial intelligence because, you know, it's, it's, it's an automated, you know, evolving state that's like a complete description of like um, uh, some theory or some world that you imagine. And it makes predictions too. You can use this to like inform, you know, clinical practice. Um, yeah, I have the rules here. Yeah, so the uh, um, susceptible people are in blue, the infected are in white, uh, and the people who are removed, which is the nice way of saying they might not be on the earth anymore, um, are in red. Um, and yeah, there's a couple of rules where you basically just like, you know, at any time step, um, you basically roll a dice. Uh, where, you know, it has many different faces on some of the faces, you know, it says infected, some of the faces it, it, it has more morbid things, uh, and some of them it says you're safe. So um, just a simple set of rules, uh, and it produces something that, you know, is actually kind of intelligent. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, we do a lot of simulation at the Turing, actually, um, through this, uh, like, paradigm called digital twins. Um, the goal of a digital twin is basically to make a, like, literally a digital copy um, of some existing thing in real life, uh, such that we can like make interjections on the thing and see what happens, you know, if we were to like, let's say, I mean, if we had like this, this bridge on the left, which I'm, I'm a little bit involved with, um, it's a 3d printed bridge in Amsterdam. Uh, it's like, oh, what happens if we like, you know, hit the bridge from the right with a large amount of force, um, because it's a really windy day and, you know, some, some boat from the canal hits the, hits the bridge. Um, we, we obviously don't want to do that in practice because we'll destroy the bridge. Uh, so it's, it's really nice to be able to do these simulations, um, uh, sort of in this way. So yeah, so there's a couple of links there if you're interested in what's going on. Um, second thing, uh, so like this idea of like a computer player or like a bot, um, sometimes in the, in the context of like a game, um, famously, uh, you know, uh, things exist that can, that can beat uh, Kasparov at chess, you know, one of the best players ever to, ever to do it. Um, and, and the way that these algorithms work is just uh, through this thing called like tree search, which is where you literally exhaust all the possible states that the game could be in, and you just pick the one that has the highest chance of success. And that's, you know, there are more sophisticated versions of this, but, you know, 
that's genuinely how a lot of these computer players work. It's just like an, another set of rules. It has some internal idea. Um, here, here's an example with like nulls and crosses. Um, you know, so it, you, know, you can look through uh, the different possible states, and it's like, oh, how many, how many states are there later in the game that have me as like circle or cross winning? Uh, and then what should I do as a result of that? Um, so yeah, that's like another kind of AI on the face of it. Um, but the kind of AI that you're hearing about these days is, is not these things really. It, it's, it's, it's this thing called machine learning. Uh, so this, this will be mostly the focus of, of the next sort of 40 minutes or so. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll quickly explain this part and then I'll, then I'll flick over to the Slack to see if you have any questions. Um, so the, the, the thing with machine learning compared to these other techniques is that it, is machine learning kind of figures out its own rules based on data that you give it. Um, I have some fun pictures here, uh, which basically like um, represent uh, some model that's been trained to recognize hand, handwritten digits. Um, what we do with that model is we kind of uh, probe the internal representation that it's learned about the digits based on the data we gave it. Um, and you can, you know, if you have a, a higher resolution screen, you might be able to see on the right that these these aren't just points in space on the right; they're actually the numbers themselves. Um, so uh, it's 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 able to, you know, kind of cluster all of the different data points into into groups based on which number that it thinks, you know, uh, the digit is. Um, so this kind of stuff is really cool. Uh, and then from there, you know, if, if you're able to identify like clusters in your data, you can start to make predictions, you know, about like given a new data point, does it fall into a certain cluster and stuff like that. Um, cool. Uh, so yes, I will quickly check the Slack. I, I, okay, no questions so far. So we'll keep going. Um, oh, sorry, I, I advanced the slide. Um, yeah, so what, um, so there's that, that's an, an example of machine learning. Um, but what can you do with it? Uh, so I've just got a couple of examples here to show you. Um, one, one thing you can do is, you know, uh, get a, a better description of your data. Uh, so here's an, a, a wonderful picture of, of three sheep frolicking in a field being, being chased by a dog, which I assume is shepherding them. Um, so you can do a bunch of different stuff with it. You can, you can, you know, recognize, uh, different, you know, categories of thing that are in your image. So I think on the left there, you know, there's like a probability of 0.6 that there is a sheep in the image, 0.3 that there is a dog, 0.1 that there is a cat, although I, I, that's not the best guess, I have to say. Don't see too many cats, but you know, only a 10% chance. Um, you get, and, and then you can, you know, detect the individual objects in the image. Um, you can do stuff, yeah, like um, intelligent segmentation. So you can say, oh, let's, you know, let's, let's find the parts of the image that like, follow you know appear to be from the same category or basically do it if they're just objects in the image at all that's the difference between the top right picture and the bottom right picture uh, is if, if you cluster them based on what category they are um, so you can you know you, you can get really good descriptions of your data with, uh, with machine learning um, here's a, a fun little um, thing that I got shown um, especially for this talk so this is a video that I'll play for you now um, where there's a tool here integrated into this um, application called uh, QPath. Uh, and you can, you can quite literally um, have images of cells um, and run a machine learning algorithm within the application itself uh, to identify like uh, some cells that follow some kind of anomaly. Um, I'm not sure, you know, medically uh, what's going on here. But um, you know, I was assured that this is a pretty cool and interesting application. And I mean, it certainly looks very cool to me. Um, there's a, there's a, like a link hidden behind the video in the slides if you want to like look more about what this is doing specifically. Um, but there's an example of machine learning kind of embedded in an application that you know like someone in clinical practice is actually using. Um, so, uh, and, and here's another thing I found while I was looking for examples. Um, so you can automate science itself in a sense with, with, with machine learning um, if you have the right ideas. So uh, this is um, an image from a paper from the machine learning group at Oxford um, on drug discovery. So um, you, you start with a set of like, you know, drugs uh, which have like certain levels of bioactivity in the body. Um, and then you want to kind of go from those drugs which are like medicinal in some way. Um, and extrapolate outside of those existing ones to new drugs. Um, and of course you can kind of fake this scenario 
by just taking a couple of drugs outside of your, uh, you know, the set that you're looking at to train on and seeing if you can recover the ones that you already know exist. Um, and so this is a, this is a cool paper um, that um, I, don't, I don't know what the specific example was that they were looking at, but they basically like, you know, um, use intelligent ways to, to extrapolate beyond the set that they started with, um, which a lot of traditional models actually don't do. So uh, um, it might be a bit of a dense paper, but it, it's there if you're interested in the application. Uh, but quite a lot of people are looking at drug discovery now. Um, I think a branch of DeepMind um, or, or like a, a spin-off company called Isomorphic Labs, I think they are basically only doing this. So it's, it's a pretty hot area for research um, at the minute. Um, I will quickly flash this in front of you uh, just to show you some different categories, just because they're words that you might end up seeing when you look in the literature, um, which are often referred to as like the types of machine learning. Um, so the first one we'll start on the left, which is also the most popular thing that you'll, you'll generally see, which is where like data that you're training a model on um, comes like with some notion of a label. You know, I showed you the image before that had like, you know, sheep in it and a dog in it. And those are like labels that we know about our data. And what we basically do is, is in supervised learning, we train data to basically recognize those labels or like to match the labels such that when we apply it to a new data point, it's going to have a pretty good idea of the label to give it because it's just seen so many examples. Um, when you don't have labels for your data, or maybe if you're doing a slightly different type of problem and you just want to find some general patterns in your data, you use this thing called unsupervised learning. Um, and then there's, a, there's a, I guess, less commonly applied type of machine learning, which is, you know, it just because it has more niche use cases uh, called reinforcement learning, um, which is like the kind of thing that's behind like AlphaGo, if you've heard of that, which is DeepMind's bot that, you know, beat the, you know, the Go champion. Um, and, and that's the kind of machine learning that works uh, by training an agent, basically. You get an agent, uh, which is, you know, some kind of like, may maybe it's like a, a neural network or something like that. Um, we'll talk more about that later. Um, and they will interact with some environment. You know, in this case, that environment would have been the, the game of Go. Uh, and it will produce a reward from its interaction. Um, you know, and depending on the re reward, it will, it will basically just keep trying to do things for the maximum reward. And if the reward is something like, uh, you know, the number of pieces that you've captured, you can imagine that over a long period of time, this can start to, you know, play quite, quite intelligently. Um, and yeah, so these are not exhaustive categories, uh, but they are pretty commonly used buzzwords. And I thought I'd basically like show you these now. Um, I'll do one more slide before I check again for questions. Uh, so I wanted to show you one, one more thing before we go into like actually kind of explaining some things about the types of models that are used, um, which is this idea of uncertainty in machine learning. So it's not talked about that often um, because it's quite a hard problem. Uh, and some fields don't really need it that much. But um, my gut feeling um, is that, especially in like clinical practice, um, I, th I would assume that it would be really important uh, whenever your model is making a prediction. Um, and you know, if a clinician it needs to use that prediction, uh, that it comes with some notion of how confident it is in that prediction. So there's a bunch of methods that um, attempt to do this, attempt to quantify uncertainty, um, in what they predict. Uh, and I've just thrown a couple of them there if you want to kind of like Google uh, a bit more about them. Um, and I have an example right at the bottom um, applied to diabetic retinopathy. Um, but indeed, I, I, it, is, it, is, it is not something that machine learning models come with naturally. Um, and, and in fact, they can be very sure about things um, that actually are completely wrong. And so what's really important uh, is to be able to like kind of capture those cases and make sure it says, you know, I make this prediction, um, but actually I'm going to tell you, maybe I'm not too sure about this. Um, and that way that can, you know, inform whether it's like, you know, informs the clinical decision or not. Um, cool. Uh, I will have a quick flick over to the Slack again. Um, is the term self-supervised the same as unsupervised? That's a very good question um, from Emma. So um, let's think. So I think self-supervised learning, if I understand correctly, is, is, is a term where basically the models that are trained uh, in some way work out their own labels. Um, do not quote me on this. Um, I will answer this question properly offline 
But when I think about this to first order, that's what my brain says. Uh, I can't verify that 100% for you, but it's very similar to unsupervised learning in that you don't have this notion of labels a priori. Um, so it's very similar, but I think there are some slight differences. Um, cool, uh, thanks for that question. Um, all right, I think that is the only one. Um, oh, there's a question from Samantha that says, uh, what about non-Gaussian distributions? Um, so uh, I think that um, that question requires a bit more specificity. I don't know if you wanted to like elaborate on that a little bit. Um, because you know, I, I don't know specifically what you're referring to there. Um, but if you elaborate, I'll, I'll, I'll happily answer. Um, oh, and then also a, from, a question from uh, from Hugh. Oh, sorry, the, the first question was from Yasa. I'm seeing this now. Okay, you're copying them over to the Slack. Um, you can also ask, them, I can see the Zoom. You can ask them in Zoom as well. Um, so yeah, knowing how sure they are, but how does, the, how does the machine learning model know what it doesn't know? So that's a very good question. Um, that's a very specific type of uncertainty as well, actually. Um, I think this is called um, epistemic uncertainty. So um, you're right, this is, this is a hard problem. Uh, and basically what you do, um, so like uncertainty um, is like a fancy buzzword, even to me. Um, generally what people mean when they say uncertainty is that, you know, your, 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 your data doesn't necessarily have this one exact value. It might actually produce a range of different values with some like amount of frequencies. Um, and when, when these models try and capture uncertainty, what they basically do is instead of model, modeling the exact values, they try and model the whole spread. And then basically what you do is when you give the value, you also give some information about the spread um, of that quantity. So you're like, okay, this value, um, you know, is predicted like this, but actually, you know, maybe there's like five models at once and you like, you average their predictions, uh, but the models predict things like slightly differently. So then you can say, okay, uh, here's my value, but you know, the spread across my values, like the variance or, or whatever, like all the highest value and the lowest value uh, are this. Um, so it doesn't necessarily know it. You kind of have to like model it explicitly, if that makes sense. Um, and that, that was one way to do it. I think, so that model I just talked about is, uh, it's this second bullet point that's called deep ensembles. Um, yes, cool. Um, I will just flick one more time to the Slack. Um, okay, yes, and that, so, so Samantha's elaborated a bit. Um, can uncertainty models deal with uh, non-Gaussian types of populations? Um, yeah, I mean, ga ga the Gaussian case is just the easier case. Um, yeah, I don't think any of these models are making explicit assumptions that the, dis the distribution is Gaussian. In fact, if it is Gaussian, you can, you know, there are probably much simpler methods that would work that aren't machine learning methods. Um, but yeah, so, not, so, so these methods are not making that assumption. Um, cool. Um, okay, I think I will, I will now move on. Um, I didn't see any more questions, but uh, once again, feel free to um, ask them and I will, I will make another pause pretty soon. Um, cool. So now to talk a little bit, a bit more about like, you know, some specifics. Um, so when people talk about AI, um, so, so he, he, here's a quote from, from this, this um, recent BBC, a simple guide to help you understand AI. Uh, the first line says like, how does AI learn? And the second line, without any hesitation or pause, goes on to talk about machine learning. Um, but actually these things are like, you know, one is a, a subset of the other, um, but that's not necessarily how it's used in, in common, uh, common language. So um, here's, here's a bit of like a hierarchy bubble to show you like what is a subset of what. Um, so AI is this very general broad term that encompasses all the stuff we talked about at the start. Machine learning is this one very specific kind of like artificial intelligence. Um, where you're learning your own rules. Um, there's also, you know, a subset of machine learning methods uh, called neural networks um, that are, you know, really popular these days. Um, lots of language models happen to be types of neural networks. Um, and ChatGPT is an example of a language model. But then when we talk about AI, people basically just mean, you know, like specifically maybe ChatGPT or things similar to it. But really, that's like this tiny subset of what is this really, really broad space um, of stuff. But just to kind of point it out um, that, you know, there's, there's some ambiguity 
uh, when you use just the term AI. Um, and I have this in the next slide, yeah. So AI is this really vague term, usually used um, you know, when people advertise summer schools like this, because it sounds fancy. Um, and it, yeah, it, it's like really, um, it, it's just kind of a corporate buzzword. Um, machine learning is like more specific than AI. That means kind of like a, a concrete subset of a field where you're learning your own rules from data. Um, neural networks are once again, a very specific kind of method. Um, but yeah, people generally are talking about machine learning and neural networks, possibly also even language models when they're talking about AI, um, at least in kind of, this seems to be common practice. So just to throw this out there. Um, yes, oh yeah, and this is also very important. So there are many useful machine learning methods that are not neural networks, like, and they work pretty well. Uh, there are just so many of them that I'm not going to focus on them today. Um, but there's a really good list if you follow this link um, written by the people who wrote the scikit-learn software. Um, and you know, when you click into that link, it's it's a massive list of things, uh, and you can you you know click into any one of them, and it'll give you an explanation. Um, so yeah, highly recommend checking that out if you need to like kind of get a survey of methods that exist already. Um, but for now, uh, and for you know a lot of the rest of the talk, we will focus on neural networks. Uh, I'll explain why a little bit later because you know they're very popular for a reason. Um, uh, so for, so we're going to talk about um, how they learn because this is the thing that I found the most perplexing and confusing when I first started the field. But having spent a bit more time with it, I think it's actually like, it's much more simple than people make it out to be. And I want to try and like translate that simple idea to you. Um, and in fact, it's so simple that you might be surprised it works. Um, so uh, I will actually quickly flick over now because I will, um, I, I will kind of go on uh, for, a little bit unbroken. Um, I would just want to ask another question. Um, is there a difference between AI and AGI? Yes, so that's another, that's a buzzword I didn't cover actually. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, so when people say AGI, the G stands for general. Um, this idea of artificial general intelligence. Um, so I showed you a couple of tasks that um, machine learning can do well. When people talk about artificial general intelligence, that's the idea of something more like, you know, human-like, right, where, um, you know, it's one thing that's good at a lot of tasks. Um, and that's, that's what, that's where the general comes in. Um, once again, it's kind of become this weird, like, tech bro word. Um, it refers to something that doesn't concretely exist. And people have a hard time even defining what AGI means, because it's not real right now. Um, and yeah, so it fuels a lot of, like, you know, doom AI type posts. Um, but a lot of that is just noise. Um, and often it like kind of, when people are talking about like mitigating harms that AGI could cause, that kind of like shifts the conversation away from like real world bias that machine learning models are doing like right now, uh, that's really important to look at. But we'll talk about this a little bit later and you have a whole ethics lecture, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. Um, cool, hopefully that clarifies that. But yeah, I will, I will now just go on for a little bit uh, unbroken and I'll pause again soon. Um, so how do neural networks learn? So when you look at neural networks, you're gonna see this thing on the left quite a lot. Uh, it's this famous ball and stick diagram. Uh, don't be scared by it. I'll explain what the balls and the sticks mean, uh, but generally what people mean when they write this diagram um, uh, is basically this notion of uh, two things. The first thing is parameters. Um, and all you need to read by that is just literally a bunch of numbers um, that we will basically get to like tune to our task later. Um, and we can choose how many there are. Um, so famously, uh, like, I think something like GPT-4, which you might have heard of, you know, a famous like language model that has the orders of like nearly like a trillion of these numbers. Um, there'll be a slide later explaining why we, why there are so many, but like, you know, for tasks that you, like people are doing like homegrown, like in my research, for example, uh, you know, I'm, I'm using stuff more on the orders of like, you know, hundreds of thousands or even like tens of thousands. Uh, so you don't need to go that high to get, you know, good results with this stuff. Um, and then, yeah, so, and then there's this idea of an architecture, which is basically like a rule on how you combine those numbers with your data. Um, and people make it out to be like really complicated, but it, it's not, um, especially like this type of diagram. So often the ball and stick thing means something very specifically. Um, and I'll show you that now. So the um the pipeline is basically like data you know a set of numbers come you know comes into one of these balls 
Uh, and what hap what the ball basically does is it, um, it, it it multiplies that data. So we're, li we're literally talking like numerical operation here. Uh, so it multiplies that data by this thing called the weight, which is just a number. And then it adds to it a term called a bias, which is also just a number. So um, you might recognize that from like GCSE maths uh, as like, this is like Y equals like MX plus C, where the weight is the M and the bias is the C. So that's the equation for like a straight line. Um, and basically if you have a bunch of different um, balls, so a bunch of different like straight lines and you try and build something with them, um, all you end up doing is modeling something that's like made up of straight lines and has no curves. Uh, and so what we have to do to add curves is this thing called like an activation function, uh, which is often called like a non-linearity, like literally read like non-line-arity, like there is no line in it because it has curves. Um, so that will often be a function that curves. Uh, and basically when you, well, when you kind of like take a bunch of curves and then you like add them together, multiply them, which is like all that's going on here. Um, it's a bunch of adding and multiplying. Um, somehow you produce something like relatively intelligent and I'll show you how we can get there in, in the next couple slides. Um, and so, yeah, this, this type of neural network. So this is like the baseline neural network that everything kind of builds off of. Uh, people call this like, um, a multi-layer perceptron or a feed forward neural network, which I, I once again, are just buzzwords I'm showing you, um, cause you know, they may come up in literature and stuff, um, or in conversations. So yeah, let's, uh, let's move on then. So. If I put my data into this MLP uh, and I, I get a result out of it, um, we need some feedback mechanism, right? To tell to tell the network how good we did. Did we get a result that we like? Um, and so um, we need, yeah, some some feedback mechanism. So normally the way we do that is basically we we just we come up with a number that represents how good the neural network did. This is called the objective, usually. Um, or the, or like the loss function. Um, and all it means is basically like, um, you know, like if you, if you, if you're kind of, um, I don't know, like lifting a weight, right? Like, it's like, how heavy is the weight? Um, and in that case, the heavier the weight, I guess the better, maybe, uh, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, but in, in, in the machine learning literature, what, what has happened is, um, things are focused around minimization because I think somehow it's in, like an easier problem. So what we tend to do is make our objective something that we want to be as small as possible. You know, like the score in golf, right? It's like flipped the same way. Um, so you come up with this number that you want to minimize um, based on your result. Uh, and then what you do um, is, is you need some kind of rule, right? That says, given the number based on the result, how do I change my parameters in my network such that the result gets better, AKA the objective gets lower. Um, and the way to do that uh, is, is, is using this thing called uh, gradient descent. And I'll explain how that works um, right now. So the, the idea is as follows. Um, if you call this whole pipeline, the workflow that takes in like your data, and also your parameters by I. And this is the only equation I'm going to show you in the whole in the whole talk. So don't worry. Um, what 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 the update rule says um, is okay. The parameters at the next iteration are the same as our current parameter, uh, like our current parameters. So like phi I, where I plus one is like the next step, um, minus the gradient of the whole workflow with respect to the parameters. Um, times by this number called the learning rate. And I will explain exactly what that means with this beautifully drawn diagram on the right. So imagine we are at, you know, we are the red ball. That's our current parameter state, phi i. Um, and the x axis is like phi, so our parameters, and the y axis um, is our objective. And we just said we want to minimize that, right? So that means we want to get to the bottom of this blue, of this blue curve. Um, if we take the gradient, if we, if we check like the direction of the slope that we're standing on, um, we can see that the slope goes upwards. Um, and to, to roll down the hill, we actually need to go in the opposite direction. And so what we do is we have to move like in the direction of the negative the slope to go down the hill. And that's why it's a minus sign here. So you, you, you know, you're taking a step down the hill in proportion to the size of the slope. Um, and if you want to increase or decrease that size um, based on your problem, you change this like number called the learning rate. 
which you know can make you, maybe you can take a step two times as long because you want to get there faster. But then maybe if you take the step too big, you're just going to end up on the other side of the hill and you'll miss the the juicy bit in the middle. Um, and that's it. Like this genu genuinely is the equation and the principle that guides all of these intelligent AI systems, uh, which is kind of crazy, right? Because um, it's a very simple idea. Um, the hill is just like very high dimensional, um, I guess is, is the way to think about it. Um, cool. So uh, this is pretty fundamental. I am going to quickly check for questions now because I think this is a an important idea. Um, don't appear to have any, so I will continue, but I will stop again soon, don't worry. Um, cool, so this is how neural networks learn. But how does it work in practice, right? Like, what, like how does this work? What, what made it work? Um, and it's, it, it's, um, it's this idea of like automatic differentiation. So it, it's being able to get those gradients really fast and have them be exact and, and just let all the computer do all the work. Um, and, you know, the way that this works is basically like, we just got really complicated, we, we got like really good hardware, Oop, sorry. Um, so, you know, if any of you, you know, maybe do a bit of gaming on the side, you, you will have heard of these things called GPUs. Um, if you haven't, it stands for graphical processing unit. Um, and these were designed for basically like video rendering um, and like playing games uh, and making like, you know, doing lots of different operations uh, at the same time to make those like, you know, games run faster. Um, but actually what people discovered is that like, this is a really important thing to like exploit um, because doing a lot of stuff at the same time is actually can make like workflows really efficient. So people wrote software to basically use these GPUs um, in, in order to like do this gradient descent stuff um, really fast and a lot of times, uh, and it seemed to work. So um, there's also this newer thing called the TPU, which is like something designed from like the ground up um, for the machine learning like applications. Um, and so the reason this worked in practice was two things. It was the hardware and the existence of the hardware. Um, and then also the software framework that let, you know, that let you actually run these workflows in practice. You may have seen a couple of these like logos or names before, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and JAX. Um, these are all frameworks that basically do algebra really fast on GPUs. And they also can calculate these gradients that we need for gradient descent um, really like, like exactly and also, also pretty fast. Um, so that's why these frameworks are important. That's why the software is important. Um, but one thing that's very interesting that I'm just, I'm kind of showing you just to really make the method clear is that you don't need a neural network to do gradient descent. It's just, it just happens to work well for neural networks. Uh, but you can use it, use it for other things too. So like, here's the same pipeline where I've literally replaced the neural network with just a straight line, y equals mx plus c. Um, and let's say we, um, let's say when the data comes in, everything on the left of it, we treat as like dogs and everything on the right of the line, we treat as a cat. Um, and like, that gives like a number zero or one, and then, which is like a result. Um, you can still do the whole like training thing. So this is, this is training. Um, but your parameters are just two numbers now. They're just the, the, the slope of the line M um, and the intercept of the line C. Uh, and you know all, all that would do is as you trained it, the line would move to try and separate all the dogs from all the cats if you had the right objective. Um, and that would, just, that would be like changing the M actually. So the C really wouldn't do anything. The C would just move it side to side. Um, and that, like, and, and that's it. So this would still work because um, you can still calculate the gradient. You know, you can you can on pen and paper or, or like with computer software, you can you can get the derivative of this thing, like literally the calculus derivative from from maths back in the day. Um, so that's a really important thing that I, I wanted to highlight. But obviously, we you know we we don't often use other stuff, although we can if we want to. Uh, so why why are we using neural networks? Um, People often talk about them in the same breath as this thing called the universal approximation theorem, which is just a, like, to me, it's also buzzwords because it's not the reason why it works, but uh, I'm just mentioning it to you for like completeness, um, which basically says that like, um, given some function that you can think of, like any function at all, uh, function just being something that like numbers go into and numbers come out from. And if you can think of something like that, um, 
you basically can approximate it with a neural network because you can write down on pen and paper, you can prove that uh, this is something you can do. But proving it on pen and paper is not the interesting thing, right? Uh, the interesting thing is that in practice, we can actually often do this. Uh, and that's the thing that's kind of crazy. Um, so it's not just that there exists a neural network that does your task well, it's that we can often find it in, in real life. Um, and he, here's like a diagram on the right to illustrate it. So, you know, th th there's like an image and, and like text. Um, keep in mind that we can convert these things to numbers. Like, you know, an image is just like uh, like pixels with different values for brightness. Uh, and then for t like for text, we can basically like map that to like a set of numbers where the numbers represent the categories. So you can often turn most things into numbers. Um, so when the image goes in, um, the top line, so this squiggly line is basically like to represent a complicated function, but one that can genuinely for real identify if there's an apple in the image. Uh, but we're just making it up because it's something we want to do. Um, it's quite likely that you can find a neural network that will, when the apple goes in, you can get it to output like Apple with a high score. Um, and that, like, that's the idea, basically. Like you think you, you, if you, as long as you can think of the thing and you have like kind of data that you can like label correctly or like in, in some cases not label, right? Because th this is the supervised and unsupervised things. Um, that's, uh, that, that's why they're so powerful is that often we can find this neural network. Um, I will now take another quick pause for questions. So I will check the Slack. Um, Okay. Does the model stop learning when the ball um, fall, falls into the bottom of the slope or does it continue to learn? Great question. Um, let's go and look. So here's our, here's our ball and slope again on the right. Um, so let's, 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 um, let's literally drag our ball to the bottom of the slope. So what do we think will happen? Um, so let's check the formula. Let's go and do the update. Um, so, okay. So what's the, what's the gradient uh, at this point in the bottom of the hill? Um, well, the slope actually right at the bottom is flat. And if the slope is flat, then the, the, the value of the slope will be very close to zero. And so this gradient term will be very close to zero. So what it's, what's likely is that the, the phi at the next step will be really close to the phi at the previous step. So what, you're, what, what you'd be witnessing there is, is, is like the algorithm converging to the correct value. So you can do as many steps as you want. Um, but what you can often do is like set a rule is like uh, for, for the algorithm to stop and say like when, when your answer is like really close to the previous answer within some like numerical tolerance, like 0 0.000001, uh, then we'll stop it. So you can do it as many times as you want. Um, and, and sometimes what happens is when you get into the the hill, sometimes you can even change the value of the learning rate to make it keep moving around a bit, just to make, just to be a hundred percent sure that you're really getting the best answer. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's my answer to that. R really good question. Um, in light of what, okay. In light of what we've learned, how do we define parameters? Right. So, um, that's, that's this thing. Um, so remember in this slide, um, parameters, uh, here it corresponds to like the, the you know this weight number and this bias number, um, but you know there's one of those numbers for every one of the balls. Um, so basically, if you have so many balls, uh, that's that's kind of the parameters we're talking about here. Um, these things called weights. Uh, and when so when GPT-4 has one trillion parameters, what that means is that um, so the architecture is a bit different. So here we have a simple architecture. Uh, whether, whether as the architecture for things that are like, you know, the GPT models are a bit more complicated, but they still have like, a, like buckets of numbers at different points in the model. And it's basically like those buckets of numbers are just really, really big. Um, and the reason why this kind of works, I'll show you a slide on this later, but like the more numbers you can have um, and the more times you kind of mix them together, the more complicated things you can model. Um, and actually, I, I think that's a really good segue to the next uh, couple of slides. So I will just talk about those right now. Um, right. So uh, there's a demo here. Um, I'm not going to click into the link um, just for the sake of time, um, but I really encourage you, you to, to click into it um, and have a play with it. Um, I will show you some screenshots from that now um, just to like, control the pace of the talk. Um, but this really, it's, it's a really nice segue uh, to what, what was just asked. So. 
Neural networks um, are often picked um, for like challenging tasks. Uh, so here, here's an example of like um, a task that maybe isn't isn't so so easy, um, which is like how do you separate the like the orange points from the blue points? And you might be telling me, Nathan, that's pretty easy, right? You just like get a pen and you just like circle circle the orange points, and you're like, and, and there you go. Um, that's because you can see the colors. Um, now imagine you have this graph, but you, did, you didn't know which ones were blue and which ones were orange. Now it gets a lot harder, right? So the idea is basically you train a model that's good at that. And then when you get some new points that aren't labeled, uh, your model will automatically be able to categorize them because you've shown it ones where you, you, know, you did have the labels. Um, so that's the idea. Um, so, Here's, a, here's, a, here's an example basically that uses like stuff that's in this you know link that I sent you. Um, so this this is like the data selection phase. So um, the thing that happens at the start is basically okay. So I have these data points in two dimensions. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose um, some a bunch of like numbers that I can get from those data points that like tell me interesting things about the data. So the first two numbers there are like the X and the Y coordinates, um, which, you know, basically represent like these pretty simple patterns in the data, you know, where the, like the orange and the, uh, and the blue represents, you know, like the different category, like the distribution of the categories uh, from each of those points. Um, you can also do stuff like, like squaring them. So, you know, the, um, this like X one, two thing is like, uh, that's like the, uh, the, the X one, which is the, you know, this dimension is like taking that and squaring it. Um, X two, two is the same thing. And then you can even multiply the X and the Y coordinates together, um, to get this, you know, more funny pattern. Uh, and the reason you do stuff like that, um, is basically like you want to give your model the best chance possible at mixing and matching these things to find something interesting. Um, as an example uh, from physics, um, so like, uh, what's a good equation? Like E equals MC squared, right? Um, let's say there are like actual variables. Um, what you might wanna do is like, you might wanna um, give the network the masses and you might wanna give them also like, you know, some, the speed of your objects. Um, maybe you also wanna square them um, or maybe the neural network will learn to square them to reconstruct the energy when it mixes and matches everything together. Um, but basically, if you, um, if you give it simple things, uh, sometimes it has to try a bit harder to like make these more complicated variables. But if you have them already, you can just feed them in as extra data. So we don't lose anything by giving it some extra numbers. Um, but anyway, so this is an example of, of, of data you might take uh, from these curves uh, that give us information about like the patterns in the data set. Now we add a layer. So Remember we had the balls and the sticks from before? Um, like it's the same thing. So like each of these, um, each of these squares on the right is like a ball. Um, and like the sticks are like the lines going in. So like the data is is, is basically going to into each um, each of these different boxes, and it's being multiplied by one of the buckets. Oops, um, it's being multiplied by one of the buckets of numbers that we talked about. Um, and that this time, instead of balls, there are just like visualizations of the type of pattern that that like, you know, um, that those numbers are picking up, basically. So um, what, what you might notice is that like, when we mix and match like a couple of these different features, the, the, the different, um, you know, the different squares are able to pick up more complicated patterns. You, you see, like we started with like a bunch of things that were only really mod modeling, like, you know, patterns that were like this or patterns that were like this, but now we're getting stuff that's, you know, uh, you're able to do diagonals um, and you're able to do like, there's just this thing that's like a ball in the center. Um, so you can see that like, when you add this like, you know, layer of new like ways to combine your data with parameters, um, then you can model more complex things in the data um, and you can keep doing this. So here's a third layer on the right. Um, where now we're learning slightly more complicated things. Uh, and you can see that like kind of everything on the right um, is really focusing hard on the center and like adding like some orange, uh, an orange classification to the orange points. Um, and yes, I mean, basically uh, like that's another thing to say is that the, the background to the plot on the right 
show like the um the category that the the, the network is predicting so um you know what you do is you basically tell the neural network you, you feed it every single point in, in 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 the square and you say is this point orange or black or, or blue and by how much is it orange or blue so you know minus one means completely orange plus one means completely blue uh, and zero means you're not sure um so if we have this network with this structure and we trained it for a very short amount of time um it does like an okay job but like you can see that it's a pretty washed picture which means mostly it's uh, it's, it's unsure um if we train it for a bit longer, what does it learn? Um, you'll see that um, a big difference actually is this, um, you might not have been able to see it from like flicking back and forth, but like it, you know, in, in the second layer, once we've trained it for a bit, you can see it picked up a different pattern. Um, and this pattern, like it's really focusing on the center. Um, and when you combine that with, with some of the other patterns in the right way, um, you see that like, oh, it, it's starting to get a bit more confident on how it categorizes the data. It's still not doing perfect, but it gets a bit more confident. Um, and then if we train it a bit longer, you can see, okay, it's actually, uh, so, so the, 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 like, um, the weights. So like when I'm talking about the buckets of numbers in this particular example, they represented the, like the value of that particular weight by the, the thickness and the, the opacity of the lines. Um, and so when the weights are really close to one, what that means is that the network is like using all that information. Because if you remember, the formula is like weight times data. So if the weight is zero, the data also becomes zero. And like the whole node just doesn't like activate. So, um, you know, and none of that information is passed along. But if the, if the weight is one, you're taking the maximum amount of like numerical information from that data and you're sending it forward in the network. So as you train it, it has some patterns that it's really sure about. And as you can see, it's very sure in its predictions now as well, because the, there's not much white line. And in, in fact, the only white line, which is like where it's less sure, is, is basically like on the border between the orange and the blue, which you'd expect. Um, and so, yeah, that's like, this is the basic idea is you, you take these like um, simple patterns and you make more complicated ones. And I have an example here of that as well. Um, so this is taken from a YouTube video um, from three blue, one brown. Uh, who who does an amazing series on machine learning. And I really highly recommend you look at it. Um, it's very accessible. Um, and basically the idea is like taking these simple shapes um, and combining them to make more complicated shapes, just exactly like what I showed you. And this is often what neural networks are doing. Uh, they, they tend to learn like what lines are and they tend to learn what circles are. And then in the later layers, they were able to build this up to like build up what a nine is and build up what a four is. You just have to like train it, right? You have to train it with the right goal in mind. Um, okay, I will, I will now take another quick pause for questions because that was a lot of stuff. Um, let's have a look. Okay, so we have uh, three questions uh, or two questions um, that I haven't answered at least. Okay, so there's one from Hugh that says, uh, is deep learning the same as machine learning using multi-layered neural networks. So the deep part of deep learning refers specifically to neural networks and it, and it refers to using lots of different layers um, so you can model really complicated things. So it, it's, an, it's another one of those vague, like shifting of the goalpost type ideas where it's like, what, when is it deep and when is it not deep? Uh, it doesn't really matter. Like it, as long as you're just using many layers, like, like, uh, like you know, more than five, it doesn't really matter. Um, but remember that machine learning, like I showed you before, like neural networks are not everything about machine learning. There's a lot of machine learning things that are not, are not neural networks. So deep learning is a subset of like using neural networks basically, which is also a subset of machine learning. Um, and then Alicia asks, can neural networks be supervised and unsupervised? Yes. Yes, they can. Uh, so there are, there are methods that, um, that, that do require labels and methods that don't require labels um, based on the goal that you decide to uh, to give it. Um, I'll maybe talk a, bit, a little bit more about that later. Um, cool. Okay. Uh, in the interest of time, I will now move on to a couple of other topics. Um, how how much longer do you want me to go on for, by the way? Because uh, I can find a natural stopping point because I realize we're kind of close to time now. Uh, so I'll, I'll quickly ask you, Emma. Keep going. Uh, I think uh, 10.40 is the cutoff, I think. 
1040. Okay, so I'll, I'll give you four more minutes. And, and there's a couple extra sections that you can look at later, um, which we won't get onto today. Um, so yeah, a quick trypophobia warning. If you don't like pineapples with holes in, look away for like five seconds. All right. Here's some weird things. Um, so here's like kind of an, ex an example of visualizations of um, the, the patterns that more complicated neural networks are learning. And you can see it gets really weird. Uh, so this is from a really cool article on, um, I think it's on convolutional neural networks, which is a type of neural network based on images. Um, and there's a link there at the top if you want to read more about it. Super weird. I want to just flash it at you because it like weirds me out every time. Um, but yeah, neural networks are crazy, man. Um, cool. Okay. So th this is probably the last thing I'll talk about, which is the importance of a good objective. Um, so there are a toolbox of things that people often use, um, which are like, you know, um, different things that you use for your objective or your loss function. Um, here are some of the more common ones. So there's this like idea of the probability to guess the right category that the data has, um, or like the difference between the model prediction and like the correct result that you want. So like, if you're trying to learn, like, I don't know, like a stock price or whatever, you, you get the neural network to guess it given some data, and then you give it the real one and then you subtract them and maybe like square the difference. Um, and that's an idea. So, cause you want that to be as small as possible. Right. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff there, but you can get way more specific. Um, so here's a, here's an example workflow for automatic car design that I've just made up. Uh, so let's say we put our road traffic data into a neural network. We use the neural network output as like parameters to build a car. And then we simulate car crash scenarios. Um, what do you think, what do you guys think is a good, a good goal here? Um, Certainly, I thought about this for a bit, and I was like, well, I mean, maybe we could design, like, oh, we could maximize the crash weight. So, yeah, survival passengers. So, I don't have to show this slide, because I was just, just in case you wanted to, like, kill everybody, uh, I have this slide here. But, okay, great. You want the passengers to survive. This is awesome. So, yeah, we could minimize the amount of crashes that we get. Um, and this is how that workflow would work, uh, you know? So, you'd minimize the crash weight, um, and then you'd update the neural network parameters with this gradient, you know, that we talked about before. So the gradient of the objective, which is the crash rate with respect to the parameters. Um, so, you know, the, it's just a different kind of slope that you want to move down. Um, so here's now, this is another example of, 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 of a goal that's like maybe slightly, it doesn't fit into the box exactly that we showed before. Um, and this is, a, this is just to kind of like get the paradigm clear in your head is that this does not have to be linear or straightforward because often people teach it like it is, uh, and then they get confused when like, you, get, you see things that are slightly more complicated because you're like, this doesn't really fit into this paradigm that people taught me was the way people do stuff. So I'm just showing you this to like destabilize that view a bit, um, which is like just another way more complicated thing that I made up where there are two neural networks in the mix. Um, so here's the first one. And maybe, the, maybe like the parameters for this, like go on to build some tires, uh, and you know, the construct a body and do a stress test. The details are not important. The important is that you know you end up at the crash rate again. Um, but you can see like what we're calling the architecture suddenly got way different, right? Before I showed you just the simple architecture, but now we have two of those in a pipeline that is not even linear, right? Like there are two different steps um, that you know go from one neural network to the next. Um, but what I want to show you is that. Um, if you, if you like kind of ignore all the complicated lines is that if you wanted to, you could minimize this stuff, like you could still do the gradient descent step, um, on the whole thing at once. So your phi, your phi I, your parameters become all the parameters in the workflow. So the first neural network had weights W1, the second neural network had weights W2, and maybe there's also like a cutoff for the tread depth, which has nothing to do with neural networks, but you want it to be optimized. And then you do your gradient descent step just with everything at once. Uh, just flashing this at you, um, we can talk about this more, but um, I, I wanna show you that because uh, it's really important for things like AlphaFold, which was really cool in the, you know, um, in the biology literature where there's a neural network, but there's a lot of complicated stuff that happens afterwards. Um, and basically that's because there's this idea of like a, um, a learnable block, so, you know, a buzzword for like something like a neural network where you want to learn some complicated behavior that you don't know how to do in real life. 
Um, and then all these complicated steps. Um, the buzzword for this is inductive bias, but you don't have to really pay attention to that. The point is that this is all biology. Like everything that happens with the neural network um, is like a, a real biological thing, like assuming the neural network was like correct. Um, and then you build literal proteins from what the neural network says, and then you minimize based on the protein, you know? So the idea of this thing, uh, last buzzword I'll flash at you is, 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 is it's called differentiable programming. And, and basically the idea is like, if you use the result of your neural network, whether it says a car crash maker, or it's like a biology protein designer, um, as if it was the thing you wanted it to be, you actually give it really useful context when it learns. Um, and that's a super powerful idea. Um, what I'll do now is I will look at the last set of questions and then I will flash my summary slide and that's it. Um, so I'll quickly look now. Um, so I, we actually have a couple in Zoom, so I'll look at that first. Um, okay, we, we were asked by Richard, would you be able to dissect the layers in a neural network like this? Um, I, unfortunately, I've looked at that at a time where I've gone through three different things. Um, dissecting layers in general is kind of hard um, when you have something that's like more complicated. When you have something simpler, like I showed you before, it's easier. But the more things that you combine, the less clear it is kind of like what, what is going on. Um, so it would depend. If you had a simple workflow, it would be easier. If you had a more complicated workflow, it would be harder because like it wouldn't, it just wouldn't be clear. It wouldn't be as clear what's, what, what's being learned. Because maybe, maybe you don't even understand the structure of your data that much and you want a neural network to do that for you. Um, but yeah. Uh, and then as Sandra asked a question, uh, just to confirm, when to create the parameters by ourselves, then transform to the formula, it means the one who, who reliably creates the formula is, is the user, in case the clinician. Um, that's a great question, uh, actually, because, um, so yeah, the formula, to, the thing to minimize, um, often people use that off the shelf um, and they make up a task uh, that works well in like using the generic things I looked at, uh, I showed you before, but I, I would say that if it's possible, the clinician would be a really useful point of contact in that process of designing that function or that task, because your, your, your network might get designed to optimize something that you as a clinician don't actually care about. And that would be really bad. Um, in particle physics, we have this problem where neural networks are often trained to classify like, you know, new particles from background. Um, but that's done using simulated data. And then the real data is actually different from that. Uh, and that's an issue. And if you train neural networks in a way, in a more traditional way with like these off the shelf functions, you, you, you like, you have no way of dealing with this. Um, so what you, you know, what my PhD focused on was like, um, making this more, uh, like making that loss function a bit better designed to like account for that. Um, oh, and then there's, there's a follow up from you that says, is it the function or the objective that matters most? Which function are you referring to? The function you choose to, oh, okay, sure. Um, like the task definition, right? So I guess you're referring to like the, the slide I had with the apple, um, which I'll quickly, I'll quickly click back to. Yeah, so it's like, you know, is it the, is it the task you choose to do or the loss function you choose um, that matters the most? I like to think they are basically the same thing. So like the task will come, the, your choice of a task will naturally lead to a choice of thing that makes like the task perform as well as possible, right? So like in this case, you know, the goal would be like probability of being an apple um, is, the, is, is the objective, but that naturally comes from the fact that I want to classify this thing as an apple. Um, Cool. I see Alicia rearing your head. Um, I will just flash my summary slide and that, that will be it. Um, cool. Um, so that I, I have a bunch of other slides that I really encourage you to like, just at least poke your head at. So I talked for a second about like um, transformers, which is what like GPT is based off of. Um, I talk, uh, I, I give you a bunch of buzzwords to Google if you want to learn about the different types of neural networks. Um, I tell you about why neural networks are, are as good as they are. A couple of problems, bias is bad. Um, I, I love this image so much. Um, here's a really sophisticated vision system that thinks the Apple is an iPod if you put the text iPod on it. And that's, that's pretty terrifying because this is, this is a pretty good model and it's being used in real life. Um, 
So yeah, uh, a bunch of bias things. So final thoughts, AI is a vague term. Um, there are good methods that are not neural networks, but neural networks are very useful. Um, do remember uncertainty if you're looking at methods. Um, we learn by rolling down a high dimensional hill. Um, and when you learn, you're composing simple patterns to build up more complex ones. Um, and you, you, you know, choice of data for a model will lead to dangerous biases, but I will hand that over to the ethics people to talk about. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nathan. Um, that was just brilliant. Uh, really, really good. Um, we could have you talking all day. I think <laughs> um, there's so much knowledge inside your head that I'm sure <laughs> everybody would like to, to well. pull off. But um, with um, we we will we are circulating slides and things. So um, I'm I'm sure. Um, yeah, I'll make those available to you, of course. Brilliant. Thanks, Nathan.